people try to understand the divine, means God, and love with logic, how do you deal with that? Logic is wonderful. Logic is a product of a well-functioning mind. And the mind is a wonderful tool. A lot of us, when we get on a spiritual path, we somehow think that the mind is the problem. The mind is just a tool. It's a tool that can be used well, or it's a tool that if it's out of control, can ruin our lives. I mean, take fire. If I need to cook food, fire is a wonderful tool. But if fire is out of control, burns our homes, burns our forests, the mind is the same. It's a fantastic tool. So logic is wonderful. Logic is something that we absolutely should use. So many decisions I make, you sit and you list your pros and your cons, okay? What are the pros of doing it this way? What are the pros of doing it that way? What are your plus and minus? How do you decide? Logic is great. The problem is the jurisdiction of logic the jurisdiction of the mind is only things that the mind can understand. Means, number one, only things we are separate from. The mind can only understand that which it is separate from. So I can understand anything that is separate from me. I can understand this paper, both I can read what's on it, but I can also understand the paper itself. It's an A4 size, it's white, could tell you a lot of things about the piece of paper. We can understand anything that is separate, can tell you about my body, can tell you about things in the world, math problem, whatever it may be. But the mind doesn't function to understand self. It has to hold something separate to look at it and understand. And so the dilemma becomes using a tool that by definition can only understand that which is separate from it. To understand aspects that at their core require connection. Love is not something to be understood. Love is something to be experienced. The question is not, how can I do a study of love and write a, write a report on love? The point is, how can I feel love? A report on love is a very poor substitution, regardless of how brilliantly written it may be, is a very poor substitution for actually experiencing love. Like a menu is a poor substitution for a meal. It just describes it. You don't actually benefit from it in any way. And so when we try to use logic of the mind to talk about the two things that the minute the mind gets in, you lose them, is a big dilemma. So if I'm, let's say I'm giving you a big hug over here. Can I give you a hug? Is that okay? Okay. So let's say I'm giving you a big hug over here. So there's two ways I can be doing this. Either I can just be in the moment. Hmm. And it's very beautiful. Or I can be here thinking, I'm giving this sweet young girl a hug. And I could think all about it and I can, you know, think about, think about what her, what her t-shirt feels like. Oh, this is a cotton t-shirt. And if, if we were in a relationship and we had issues in our relationship, I could be thinking about, oh, she's not hugging me back enough. I'm hugging her more than she's hugging me. 
clearly I love her more than she loves me. And my mind can do all kinds of things. Or maybe we have a different issue. Maybe, oh my God, we shouldn't be hugging. Or maybe it used to be nicer when we hugged. Or maybe I'd rather be hugging somebody else. So my mind does all kinds of things. During which, even though my arms may be hugging, I'm not actually benefiting from that hug because I'm not in the hug, I'm in the mind. The arms are doing it, but I'm not having an experience of loving union and connection. I'm in my mind. When we are experiencing love and you go into the mind, you lose that experience of love. And it happens sometimes without us meaning it, you know, where you're in the midst of, oh, and suddenly the mind clicks in and you're already out of it. The minute the mind clicks in, you're no longer in the love. And this is where it's so important to learn how to allow the mind to be quiet so that in the moments where you just want to be, and it may be hugging someone. It may be watching the ocean on the beach. It might be meditating. It might be painting. It might be making music. It might be doing anything that connects us to spirit, soul, consciousness, love. We benefit only when we're not in the mind. Similarly, of course, with divinity or God. You can't understand God. Not because God isn't understandable, but because our tool is not good enough. It's not the fault of love or divinity that logic can't get them or our minds can't get them. It's that the tool of the mind as we have it now the evolution that our cerebral cortexes have gotten to, to this Dayton evolution, is not high enough to be able to understand love or God. We've got science down, we've got technology down, we've got so much down. And who knows? 100 years from now, 200 years from now, maybe our brains will be able to also see and hear God. The fact that we can't experience God with our senses, I believe is due to the fact that just our tools aren't quite good enough yet. And there was a time hundreds of years ago where if you sat in a math class or a science class, and the teacher said, so is the earth round or flat? And you said, flat. The teacher would say, right, you'd get 100% on that. Now, do you know, is the earth round or flat? Round. Right. So even, even seven knows that today. But go back a couple hundred years, and the truth was, it's flat simply because our tools weren't good enough to tell us it was round. The earth obviously hasn't changed shape, but our tools have changed. There was a period of time where if your science teacher said to you, so what revolves around what? And you said, well, everything revolves around the earth. See, I can see it. I stand here. The sun is going. The moon is going. Everything is going. Everything's going around. The planets, everything's revolving around the earth. Now we have better tools. We understand, oh, actually we are revolving around the sun. We and the planets are all revolving in different orbits around the sun. Only the moon revolves around us. But that's not because the solar system has changed. It's because our tools have gotten better. And so science, logic, the mind, is a tool. 
And it's a tool that up to this moment, it's really good with everything it's separate from. It has no ability to measure, to see, to understand, to know about that which it's not separate from. And that's where we have to rely on our hearts. Because luckily we don't only have a mind, we have a heart. And the heart is what enables us to know love and to know God. And so that's why it's so important to cultivate both. The mind for understanding that which we are theoretically separate from, not really separate, but at least as we move through the world, it helps to hold things in a way that we can understand them logically. And our hearts, our intuition, because when I say heart, I don't mean impulsive emotions. I mean our, our deep, intuitive understanding and experience and awareness. Knowing, you could say. We need that to know everything else, to know, to know love, to know God, to know the self. Because I, I have to be evident to myself. So I know you because of my senses. I know that you are sitting here next to me because I can see you. And if I close my eyes, I can still feel you because my arm is on you. But if I take my arm off, I can still hear you because you're moving a little bit. So I still know you're here. But if you stop moving and I keep my eyes closed and I'm not touching you, I have no way of knowing that you're still there. Are you still there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. But I don't have any way of knowing that. But my lack of knowing doesn't change the fact that you're here. It just means I don't know you're here. I don't have any way of interacting with you. In the same way. The divine is there. God is there. People say, prove it. Well, you've got yourself into a catch-22 because the only way we know how to understand, how to know, is our five senses. And every time we're in a situation where I can't see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it, it isn't evident to me. And I jump to the conclusion, well, therefore, it must not exist. But as we've just proven, even if I can't see, hear, smell, taste, or touch you, you're still here. You don't change just because I can't know that you are here. We just need to develop better tools. That's the connection. Because if I get really quiet, I can feel you. Not with my body, because my body's not touching you. But if I get really, really quiet, if I close my eyes and I sit really still and I get really quiet inside, there's an energy of you and there's an energy of me. And I can feel you. But I have to get really quiet to be able to feel that because it's not my five senses energy. It's not like you're close enough to my skin that I can, you know, feel the wind of you. But I can feel the energy of you. And that's, that's a tool we need to cultivate more, is that we talk about a sixth sense. There's, I think, a lot more senses than five. But it's okay if we just use sixth as an umbrella term for everything else all of our other ways of knowing. And that's how we know things other than with the five senses, in our hearts, in our intuition, in our energy. Because <coughs> if you can only rely on your five senses, we miss out on knowing a lot in the world. So use logic, use the mind. 
but just don't let it brainwash you into thinking that it has jurisdiction over every aspect of your life. It has no jurisdiction over love and no jurisdiction over God, divinity, spirit, connection, consciousness, all the good stuff in life. <laughs>